everybody, we're back, and uh, we're in our uh, verse-by-verse studies, and currently I'm choosing various uh, psalms to go through, and uh, honest with you, I've, I've never, ever picked various psalms in a series or study to do, and so it's kind of fun for me. We started last week with it, and today we're going to continue, and i got to be honest with you, what I'm starting today is Psalm chapter 8. We're going to look at the glory of God, and I've always been fascinated in, in from multiple directions of Psalm chapter 8, and uh, I had only planned on this to be one message, but now it has evolved and expanded. It's going to be three teachings for the next three Wednesdays on Psalm chapter 8. And those of you who have been around me a long time, verse by verse, you know I can go on and on on one, ver- one or two verses. So I'm going to wrap it in three weeks, but it's going to be potent and power-packed as David's psalm. It's, it's a great, great psalm. So... <clears throat> Let me give you a little thoughts in the background of things as David is uh, writing this thing. One of the greatest, uh, and I've had many great moments in the outdoors, but one of the greatest moments that I've ever had um, was around mm, 12, 11, 12 years ago. And I was at 12,300 feet. I was on my overnight stop of a three night uh, or two night journey, three day, two night journey to get to the top of Mount Whitney. <clears throat> now, at 12,300 feet in the first week of October, it gets cold. It's cold up there. And so we were in our three-man dome tents, and, uh, and we decided to go outside at about 11 o'clock at night. And so we did. And standing at 12,3, and the next day we're going to climb to 14,508 or 9 or 10 or 11, whatever Whitney is, because it keeps heightening. Um, there's no lights up there. It's just dark. And that night, as I looked into the sky, and me and my buddies, it was one of the most amazing sights I have ever seen in my life. To look up at all those stars in their glory. In, in the, in, it was, everything was dark, like I said, so they shined with brilliance. You could see the Milky Way galaxy. It was so cloudy looking when you could really see it. And those clouds are basically just billions of stars. And it's one of the small galaxies. But it was an amazing sight. But I had to go up 12,300 feet to see that. David is writing this psalm, I believe, from many, many nights of experience when he was a shepherd boy out there in the desert in the Middle East almost 3,000 years ago with no lights, no lights around him at all. It's so dark. And he looks up into the night sky and he sees all the stars and everything. (laughs) And he's just awestruck. And so one day he takes his, you know, his writing utensil, his pen, and he begins to write. And he writes a psalm that is so centered around the glory of God. And rightly so. Because I don't know how you can look up at the sky at night especially out in the places away from city lights, and you see this thing. And then you, if you ever take astronomy classes, you see how vast this universe is. It's, it's just an amazing thing. So we're going to look at this psalm, Psalm chapter 8. We're going to only cover two verses today, but many cross-referencing verses. So if you've got your Bible, you better be ready. In fact, if you're not used to cross-referencing your Bible, you're probably going to feel really spiritually stiff tomorrow, if not the second day after this, from all the biblical usage and moving around. So here we go. Verse 1, Psalm 8 says this. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. i got multiple things to say about this. Notice he begins with this. Our. We must begin with our. That's relationship. Our Lord. I'm in relationship with God. That's where he begins. Otherwise, the rest of the psalm makes zero sense. You see, I'll never see the glory of God until I jump into the story of God. Let me say it again. I'll never see the glory of God until I jump into the story of God. Until I've confessed with my mouth, Jesus Christ the Lord, believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead, and make him my Lord and Savior, and the one whom I follow and lay down my life for and live the rest of my life for, and the Spirit of God comes to live within me, I'll never see the glory of God until I jump into the story of God. 
You see, if I don't jump into the story of God, I'm just led by a mindless, unguided, through random processes created universe. But when I'm in relationship with God, it just changes everything. I begin to see that the universe didn't create me, that God created the universe, and God created me. And the Spirit of God illuminates me. And I look at the sky at night, and I see the glory of God in the heavens. And it changes my perspective in life. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 2.14. Now watch this. Like I said, we've got a lot of moving around to do, and hopefully I can turn my Bible fast enough with you. Now it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, But a natural man, that's a non-believing, non-filled with the Spirit person who's never given their life to Christ. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. A non-believer, God bless them, they'll never understand God. They'll never experience uh, experience or understand spiritual things. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And he, Jesus lays it out, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus goes, what? Unless Jesus goes, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. <laughs> and Nicodemus is having trouble with these things. And finally he says, how can these things be? What's the problem? He does not understand spiritual things, though he is so religious and religiously trained. He's not born again. You can be as religious as you want to be, but that don't mean nothing. I grew up religious. It meant nothing. I didn't know God until I came into a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ and, his, and what he did on the cross and his resurrection. The Spirit of God came to live in me, and I'm not religious anymore. I'm in a relationship. That's what Nicodemus couldn't understand. Until at that cross, when he saw Jesus die that day, and Jesus had earlier said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Nicodemus saw, he finally put it together, he understood, he put faith in Jesus, and he's one of the two guys that took Jesus off the cross. You will never understand these things. You'll never look at the creation and see God until you jump into the story of God. I'll never see the glory of God until I jump into the story of God. It begins with our God. That's where David started. Now, in verse 1, he also says that God is above the heavens. Your splendor is above the heavens. What does that mean? The universe can't contain God. God contains the universe. Let me say it again. The universe can't contain God. God contains the universe. That just, did that blow your mind? <laughs> it blew my mind. Think about this. And this is just a little bit. Because I like going in the backyard at night in my house getting my that star walk app and looking at the stars and seeing this and that what's up there I, I love I love stuff like that Mars you see Mars clearly at this time of year 45 million miles away you look up in that same night sky you see Jupiter very very clear in, lately in the night sky for months now 390 million miles away Venus in the winter time if you look to the west You'll see Venus. It's the brightest thing in the sky after the sun and the moon. It's 25 million miles away. Saturn, which is a little bit below Jupiter, a little bit to the left, it's not as bright as Jupiter because it's so far, 792 million miles away. But these are planets. They're close. <laughs> close, yeah. Because after the sun, which is 93 million miles away, depending if it's winter or summer, it could be 93 and a half... 91 and a half to 93 and a half million miles away. But after the sun, the nearest star, get this, is over 4 million light years away. You said 4 million miles? No, light years. Well, how long is a light year? How far is that? That's how far light can travel in a year. Now, let me tell you the speed of light in case you forgot. The speed of light, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. If you could shoot a gun at that speed, that bullet, that bullet would travel around the earth seven and one half times in one second. That nearest star after the sun is four million light years away. That's the nearest one. There are some so far out there, we, we can't even see them. They need Hubble telescope to discover those things out there. 
And yet, he, we look at the night sky and we stare at those things, and here's what it says about God and those stars to show you how vast and big God is. Genesis 1.16 says this. I love this verse. It's in the creation record. And it says, God made the two great lights, sun, moon, and, ga- and greater light to govern the day, sun, lesser light to govern the night, moon. Eh, he made the stars also. <laughs> Don't you love that verse? Uh, he speaks it all into existence. He goes, oh yeah, and I made the stars. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> I, I made the stars. Spoke them into existence. Who spoke them into existence? Look at John chapter 1. Just to set the record straight on who Jesus really is for some of us, because we need to understand who our Lord is. In John chapter 1, it says in verse 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. First off, to define the Word, you go to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word is Jesus Christ. But notice what it goes on to say in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. So there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, meaning Jesus, the Word, Nothing came into being that has come into being. Who created everything that we see? Who created all? Jesus. And it makes sense that since He's the Word, He spoke. And those stars are created. Isn't that something? He spoke it. Now, to understand all these things, because David said, remember, that uh, your splendor is above the heavens. You put it all together in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10. Watch what he says, Ephesians 4.10. He says this. <clears throat> he who descended is himself, Jesus came, he descended, is also he who ascended, he ascended to heaven, but he ascended above all the heavens, mm. so that he might fill all things. So Paul says, he writes, Jesus ascended above all the heavens. David says the same thing. Your splendor is above all the heavens. Jesus is above all everything. I mean, he's above everything. Glory to God. We serve the creator of it all, the one who controls it all. Now, let's, let's go on. Now, in verse 1, um, <clears throat> it says, uh, let's see. In verse 1, he says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh. Now he says, your name. How majestic is your name, or how excellent is your name in all the earth? The name of Jesus, his miracles, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, which is the gospel, has filled the entire earth, the world. He is glorified in parts of all the world. <clears throat> some countries, they want nothing to do with Jesus and Christianity. In fact, they make it against their law for anyone to share faith, to share this gospel with others, and to convert them. In fact, if you do convert someone, you can be arrested, thrown in prison, and even killed in some countries. Isn't that wild? Isn't that, that kind of crazy? So I have a question. If you've never thought about it, why is the name of Jesus so dangerous to some people in some countries? Why? I'll tell you why. Because you can name all the other false gods, Buddha, Allah, Confucius, whatever. They're all dead. Jesus is alive. (laughs) He's alive right now, man. And every demon and the devil know that Jesus is alive. And that makes Jesus dangerous to demons and the devil because remember, Adam handed the world over to the devil when Adam sinned. And the devil wants control and he sets up fortresses and strongholds all over the world and even in your families and in your life if you let him. Jesus is alive and the demons know it. One day Jesus is he gets the disciples in the boat. He makes them cross over and, you know, and there's a storm and he's asleep in the boat. You know, he's, he's so calm. Wake up, we're dying. And he wakes up and he calms the storm. And basically in the Greek, it's like he's saying to the storm, shut up. 
which we draw from that idea that it's a demonic storm, demonically motivated. He speaks to us like it's a demonic entity. They get to the other side of the lake, and the disciples, after that happened, he goes, who then is this who even calms the storm? They don't even know who he is yet. He comes on the other side. There's a man demon-possessed with a legion of demons. Remember that? They run, the man runs up to Jesus, and the demons speak, and they say, Jesus, what do we have to do with you? First of all, it means, what do we have in common with you? Meaning nothing. But here's what's cool. They run up to Jesus and fall down. They go, Jesus, do they know who he is? You better believe it. Did they know he was coming? You better believe it. Why do you think that Satan tries to drown Jesus in the boat in the Sea of Galilee? They knew he was coming and they know who he is. Why? Because they've known him since Jesus created those demons when they were angels and yet they rebelled against God and fell. They've known him and they know who he is and they are scared of the guy. In fact, they still shake. The demons tremble. The name of Jesus is powerful. Why? He's alive. Some Christians walk around like Jesus is dead. Like it's over. He's alive in the midst of the deepest, darkest darkness. He's alive. And he's alive in you. So live like he's alive in you. Mm, I like that. Now, sidebar. This is going to be fun now, okay? It's going to be real fun. I guarantee it. It's going to sidebar here. In Psalm chapter 19, because remember, David's looking up at those stars. In Psalm 19, and uh, verse 1 through 3. It says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. So like David, and he writes this also, he says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. In other words, this is natural revelation. Romans 1 tells us that you can look up at the creation of God, and by natural things, you can, this is the revelation of God to tell you there is a God, there is a creator, there's a designer. Verse um, 2. Now watch what he says about, as he looks up to the heavens. Day to day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. What? What's he saying? He's saying the heavens, the stars, the sun, the moon, and all the creation, it speaks. It speaks of the glory of God. It speaks of the revelation of a designer, God, a creator, even though it never says a word. Does your life speak of a creator in the way you live and act, even if you never said a word? Mm, there's a question, huh? Now, <clears throat> let me take this somewhere. <clears throat> now, the heavens declare the glory of God. Let me couple that now. Let's go back to Genesis 1 and verse 14. Genesis 1, 14 says this. I told you you had to do a lot of cross-referencing, and I hope you have your Bibles so you can learn things. Verse 14 says, and this is a creation record. It says, <clears throat> Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Uh, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Uh, notice one of the four. They're for signs. Okay. What's a sign? The idea of the word sign there indicates that it's a pointer to something other than itself. Those stars up there are, are, are up there because they're declaring something. They're pointing to something other than themselves. What are they pointing to? What are they declaring? What, what are they saying to us? Let me show you the answer. In Job, the book right before Psalms, it, Job chapter 38. Job has a lot of great things to say when you really do some good study in it. But Job 38 and verse 32, it's, Job says this. Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? Now, the word constellation right there. That word right there is a Hebrew word, Maseroth. We get our word zodiac. Oh, the Bible speaks of the signs of the zodiac. You betcha. You better believe it does. Now, <clears throat> Do you know that those signs of the zodiac, which have been distorted 
by non-believing pagans starting at the Tower of Babel and all of the distortions came through Babylon and much of your false religions today came from Babylon. They were distorted a long time ago. And so the message that people tell you now with the signs of the zodiac and what's your sign and this and that, hogwash. Don't pay attention to that. That wasn't the original intention. Those signs up there, God said in the heavens, let the heavens declare the glory of God. They pointed to something other than themselves. There's a message. In those signs of the zodiac, I'll give you two of the signs of the zodiac. Okay. <clears throat> the first, you take Virgo. Okay. Virgo is a deliverer, a supernatural deliverer because he's born of a virgin. Yet he is the son of God. It announces the coming of the Messiah, born of a virgin, Virgo. You ever think about that? It's awesome. You jump to the very last one, and I don't have time to go through all of them. You jump to the very last one in the order in which they go. Then you have Leo. What's Leo? He's, he's the lion. He's the triumphant deliverer. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. Yeah, he destroys the serpent. The heavens declared the glory of God. Can I give you something fascinating and interesting that I discovered years ago in study, uh, reading certain books and certain things about this? Let me share it with you. I think I've only shared this maybe twice in my entire life, this thing. But I, it, it's fascinating. Virgo's the first. Leo's the last. Starts here, Virgo ends with Leo, and it comes together. Okay. In Egypt, listen, there's a 4,000-year-old sign of a zodiac in Dendere, inside a temple. <laughs> where Virgo is, where it starts, and where it all ends, signs of, and Leo ends, in between those two, is an image of the Sphinx. Isn't that fascinating? The Sphinx, half woman, half lion. Signs of the Zodiac. Virgin, woman, Leo, lion. They understood those things. Now, I don't know that they understood that this was the heavens declaring the glory of God and the Messiah to come and he would be the triumphal deliverer. I don't know if they understood that. But it kind of is interesting that they create this giant sphinx out there by the pyramids in Giza. Part woman, part lion. Signs of the zodiac. Virgo to Leo. I just think that's fascinating. Maybe you didn't like that at all, but I did. And let me show you why. Because Virgo and Leo, watch this, Virgo. Genesis 3.15 says this. <clears throat> It says, this is after the fall, and now God is declaring of what he's got to do because mankind has blown it, like we all do, and now we need a Savior. Now it says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, mm. and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So now it's declared that coming through a woman will be the Messiah. Can you imagine every time a male Jewish boy was born, Satan's paranoid? Because <laughs> he didn't know which, when, when Jesus came. But here it comes. Here it comes. It's going to come through the seed of the woman. Here's, it's Virgo. Here it is. But then you look all the way into Revelation at the end, chapter 5 of Revelation, and look where it takes you to at the end. I just love this stuff. I just love this stuff. Revelation 5, verse 5 says, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. The lion has overcome. The deliverer has conquered. From Virgo to Leo, the heavens declared the glory of God and the whole story is up there. But the world, the culture, Babylon, Tower of Babel, pagans have distorted it. It doesn't even mean anything of what it originally intended and it pointed to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, and how he would conquer. And that's something. It's for signs. Now, 
I got to move on because that's fascinating stuff to me. Look, look now. We got to go to verse 2. Psalm 8. That was just verse 1. So, verse 2 now. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Stop. Cease. <clears throat> Let me make a statement. Let me back it up. Jesus equates praising God with strength, or you could say he equates strength with praising God. David writes, in the mouth of infants, nursing babes, you have established strength. Jesus is going to quote that verse in Matthew chapter 21. He's going to quote it when little kids are calling him the son of David and everybody's getting mad. All the religious people, because they don't understand the things of God, because that's what religion does. Religion blinds. But a relationship with Jesus, with the Spirit of God, it opens your eyes. Now watch, in Matthew chapter 21, in verse 15, 16, it says, But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, Jesus did some great things. And the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, they became indignant. Uh-oh. Hosanna means save us like right now. Son of, son of David, that's a messianic thing. Uh-oh. The kids are shouting that out. Uh-oh. You better shut your kids up. Uh-oh. Verse 16. And he said to him, and, and, and said to him, this is what they're telling Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, babies, you have prepared praise for yourself? They fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm 8-2. Jesus says, yes, haven't you ever read that? That out of the mouth of nursing babes, praise is going to come out? You've perfected praise? David called it strength. Jesus called it praise. Hmm. <clears throat> Could it be that when we praise God, it builds us up? It builds us up. Could it be that when we're going through things, we say, well, I can't go to church and I can't worship God, we're actually defeating ourselves more? Could it be? The Bible is equating Praise with strength and strength with praise. Hmm. I like that. Out of the mouth of nursing infants, young people. Wasn't David a young, 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 young man when he began to be a worshiper of God and play the instrument? And God gave him the strength to defeat Goliath? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Let me tell you something about this. God is telling us that the infants, the children, the humble, they're the ones who receive the revelation of God also. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 and verse 25. Watch this about infants. 11, 25 of Matthew. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. I'm not trying to sound condescending or arrogant or something like I know some, I only know some things because I've studied them and that's it. I don't come up with these things. It's all from God. You ever just listen to people sometimes highly even highly educated people in high positions and they just don't sound smart you see God hides these things when we live in arrogance but when we humble ourselves before God and declare that God is God <clears throat> which means I have a willing heart to accept what it says when I read it that God reveals it, reveals it, reveals it, and reveals more to me. 
That's a fact. That's a Jesus fact. But if I approach the Word of God to read it and I'm not going to obey it because I'm the shot caller of my own life, even though I say God is Lord, I'm not going to get revelation from the Word of God. I'm not going to get understanding. He hides it from me until I have a willing heart. Why is it when you share your faith with somebody, they just don't get it? You're sharing the symbol. They don't get it. Why? Because they're, they're remember, natural thinkers? He hides those things. But here's the cool thing. Even though they're not getting it, once you share that Word of God, it get, it's in there and it's starting to percolate. It may take months or years, but it's percolating. It's in them. <clears throat> now, if you think about what David said, he starts with the, with, you know, the glory of the heavens. And he goes to, out of the mouth of infants, the glory of God, praise comes out. That covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? The glory of God covers above the heavens all the way to nursing infants. The glory of God is everywhere. Now, nursing infants. Um, <clears throat> I, I, have, I have two granddaughters. One more kid, one more on the way. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Next one. Probably looks like me, though. Um, I try to get my the grandkids to say granddaddy as their first words. <laughs> Why not? Um, now, Lincoln, she's only two and a half months old, so I, you know, I'm just prepping her now. But Willa is 15 and a half months old. And so I always, say, I always tell her, say, granddaddy. Granddaddy, it's three syllables. Now she'll say dada. But the other day, she said da da da. Works for me. <laughs> All right, she said my name, Granddaddy. Da da da. Now it's it's hard to get that word out of her, but she says da da plenty. But she says da da. She says, Daddy. She says, Father. Can I get you to train your kids well? I don't know how many people who have young children or children are watching a verse-by-verse -verse study. I don't know. But can I get you to train your children well? Can I get you to get those kids in church? Get him into the Bible? Can I get you to get him in there to begin to be a praiser and worshiper of God at a young age? Can I get you as a parent to make sure that's one of the most, if not the most important thing you can do with your children? And you only have one chance. I was a student ministries pastor in the late 80s and I've told these stories before. I watched people make God down on the totem pole of importance. And then I get the call one day from those parents, church going people now and here and there, but that's not fully, not fully involved. They go, you need to talk to my 14, 15, 16 year old. They want nothing to do with God and they're going down the wrong road. And I'm thinking, you think because I can talk to them one time or two times, that's gonna change their life? You set these roots down a long time ago. You laid the foundation of this a long time ago. Of course they don't want God. They haven't watched parents want God fully. Why would they want God? And then if you send them off to a college, a secular college, they're going to really teach them that there is no God, that they are products of an of a unguided, mindless, random process universe. Because that's really one of the big goals now in college. You say, it isn't. Yes, it is. Don't be naive. You better train them while they're young. You better get those little kids when they're young say, Dada, da, Father, and lead them to a Heavenly Father. Because that's what's most important. That's what's most important in their lives. Now, <clears throat> last question, big question. Why is the praise of God so important? Because back in Psalm 8, 2, it says at the very end of it, it says, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. 
praise shuts up, silences the enemy. It does? Yeah. In one of the descriptions uh, of Satan, Lucifer, in, in uh, Isaiah 14, he's called, O sun in the morning. <clears throat> um, and so, O star of the morning, I'm sorry. And that Hebrew word is Hallel. See, Satan's name when he was one of the, he was the highest angel in heaven of creation, but his name was Hallel. We get our word Hallelujah. So when we sing to the Lord and Hallelujah, he hears that, it reminds him of who he was and what he lost, and he hates it. And he's got to run. And he's got to flee. Because we're lifting up the name of Jesus, just like when those demons came at the shores there in Mark chapter 5 said, Jesus, what do we have to do with you? Now, there's nothing in common here. And so as a believer, when I live for God and I worship God and I lift my hands because out of the mouth of infants, out of the mouth, you can't come in and just be like this, this is the way I worship. No, out of the mouths. You've got to speak it, you've got to sing it. You've established strength and praise. It's important, it's important that we declare the glory of God, that we worship and live for the glory of God and teach our kids that. Well, I'm going to stop there with these two verses. Next time we'll pick up in verse 3 and verse 4. Alrighty? God bless you. We'll see you next time.